In today's episode, Alex and I dive into some of our favorite tips and tricks when it comes to tracking macros. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review and make sure you share this with a friend. We'll catch you on the inside. Sue, we are coming up on the end of summer and it is, well, it's the best time in the Midwest. It's about to be fall. My favorite time. Now there's, there's favorites and there's definitely cons to fall here, but what are your favorite fall things? Let me hear some of these cons to fall. Allergies. I feel like that's more summer than fall. Allergies. I, I have been sneezing. I've been itching my eyes. I feel like that's been nonstop. That hasn't been a deterrent. I uh, I would say that it uh, there was a period of summer where that wasn't the case. Okay. What other cons? That's the only con, but it's a pretty big con because I will say I have pretty aggressive allergies. You do, you do. Yeah. Uh, pros of fall. My favorite clothes get to shine because it's sweater weather. It's sweatshirt time. It's sweatpant time. It is sweatshirt with shorts sometimes. It's sometimes pants with a tank top, but... It is sweatpant time. Yeah, my favorite outfit is the sweatshirt with the shorts mm. or a long sleeve with shorts. It's, it's my favorite attire. And so whatever portion of fall allows me to wear that outfit, I'm thrilled. And I just feel like, you know, you get to layer some clothes because there's really not any layering with summer. But I like that there's a difference in season because I enjoy having the time where it's just like, Here's a tank top. Here's a pair of shorts. But then I get excited for the time where I'm like, "Ooh, I can put some layers on this fit. I used to be extremely anti-layer. Yeah, you did. Very <laughs> much so. I, I still would say that I'm semi-anti-layer. You but get I'm, like claustrophobic. Yes. I, having a t-shirt on <laughs> under a sweatshirt stresses me out. When that's my favorite. I hate wearing just a sweatshirt. I would greatly prefer just a sweatshirt. <laughs> Like the the sweats or the t-shirt under the sweatshirt just never feels comfortable to me. It really? feels bunched up and just like pressed against me too much. Well, the wrong t-shirt for sure. What's the right t-shirt? One that is like oversized, but not too oversized that's bigger than the sweatshirt. Right. So I mean it's it's a pretty specific shirt. Yeah. Um, because then you like if you if the sweatshirt's too tight. And then the shirt is like fraying out of the bottom. I mean, it, <laughs> looks, it looks ridiculous, right? Um, but there's a cool way of doing it where like the sweatshirt isn't tight and it's layered nicely. Yeah. But more often than not, the sweatshirt's a little snug. And so then it looks ridiculous. And so then you look like you're in eighth grade again and can't dress yourself. Um, so I'm just, I'm much more keen on sweatshirt, no shirt. Okay. What other things do you like about fall? I love the crispness mm. of the air. I love, love the it. the temperature. It also means football. So mm -hmm. I couldn't be any happier. This past weekend was the first weekend for football. And I was Colorado ecstatic. came around with the W. I know. Uh, Dion is, I mean, he's, they're probably going to win the national championship. I put money on it today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. You want to know what the odds are? Why wouldn't I do this? I need to pull it's this very up. very unlikely is why. <laughs> well, yeah, it's unlikely, but that's, you got to. You got to believe. You got to. We believe. We believe in Dion. We coming. But you got to, you know, bet big to win big. Well, I, I don't bet think it's necessarily odds. bet big. Well, yeah, sure. All right. Here's what it is. They are plus 30,000 <laughs> to win the national championship. But I believe. For those who are not familiar with gambling, plus 30,000 <laughs> means that if she was to bet $100, she would win $30,000. Oh, my God. So even just betting a dollar, you're winning a lot of money. Yeah. So I'm going to. Come around national championship time. <laughs> we'll see how much money I got in my pocket. Well, if they if they have a chance, those odds are going to drastically change. Yeah, but I got in when the odds oh. were what they are. Okay. I didn't know that you already put in a slip. Oh, I'm in. Interesting. I believe. Awesome. Do you not believe? I do believe. I don't know if I believe that much, though. I believe. Dion, <laughs> if you're watching this, I believe in your team. I've always believed from the start. And... You can come on our podcast if you'd well, like. Well, in fact, you have wanted a tattoo of him. I have. If anyone has any really good Dion tattoo ideas, Dion, you can pitch one yourself as I well. I have amazing ones. You want what? like a fewer, full mural? <laughs> you I mean, like Keen a, can do it. I know. Keen could do it. I think that you could. I mean, I think on your calf could be cool. <laughs> a full mural? Oh, yeah. It'd be amazing. Like current him? No. Or should it be like him, him merging dancing. in both of his like uniforms or something? That would be... 
part baseball, part football. Yeah. That would be so interesting. I was thinking of just, yeah, I've got an image in my mind. I don't really know how to explain it. Okay. All right. Well, we'll work on it a little bit. We'll workshop it. But before we move on, there is one really important thing you're missing about fall that makes it like the best ever in the whole entire world. Okay. My birth month. Oh, of course. Yes. (laughs) How did you not think of that to begin with? It's a very important part. It's actually just part of my life. I don't even have to say it's part of fall. It's part of my every year that I have to plan accordingly for. Yes. And you've done a great job. You've really embraced the tradition. And I love that. This is year six of my commitment um, to to your birth month. Um, I had never met anyone that celebrated all 31 days of their birth month until I met you. Um, And it's well-deserved. We should celebrate you all 365 days. We should. That is a great idea. (laughs) You know what? We'll change plans for 2024. (laughs) It's the year of Sue. Exactly. Actually, Alex's grandpa had reached out to him the other day and was like, I think I have Sue's birthday wrong because I have it in as her birthday being the uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th. And Alex was like, yeah, that is wrong. It's just 1 through 31. Uh, So we've got it nailed down. We're in a good spot. Your birthday is also in fall, so that's exciting. Yeah, sure. But... Which is going to have an attachment of the coolest product and thing that I've worked on for so long. That is true. A little teaser and, there. And, <laughs> uh, and Gus's birthday is, is coming up. Coming up. Which is crazy to think about. How He's going to be the big eight. Gus is eight. Will yeah, be eight. Will be eight. Wow. But, you know, I did hear something the other day that kind of blew my mind. And you might already know it because it might be common sense. But whatever age you're turning is the year you just finished. Correct. So like, you know how people are like ready for my 30s when they turn 30? It's like you just finish your 30th year. Right. Like you don't, you're not born and you're one year old. Yeah. Right. So, (laughs) right? When I found out, yeah, today is not that day though. Okay. But (laughs) I understand you're not born and you're not one, but also isn't that crazy of like, You've been thinking of like, can't wait to be 30. And it's like, you've just finished being 30. Sure. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. Mm -hmm. There's actually in a different country that people had started with like when they're born, they turned one. And then I think it was in China that when it got to December was like when people's birthdays came again or something. And so there are people that were born and were one year old when they were born. And then their birthday had fallen in a weird time frame that by the time they were like just a few months old, they were already notated as two years old. And so then they had to roll that back and people lost like a year or two on their birthday, like overnight. That's interesting. It is. I don't know where exactly it happened, but I read it, so I'm sure it's true. Maybe somebody listening will look it up and confirm it for (laughs) us. Confirm it for us. Uh, But today we're going to get into some stuff about food. Okay. So we have done a few different episodes on, of course, food and nutrition in general, but specifically on macro hacks and tips and how we navigate around food. So with that, I thought it would be great to hear a little bit about how long you have been doing flexible dieting. Oh, gosh. Um, So with flexible dieting, I'm just going to put this in the category of tracking macros. So I have been doing tracking macros since I was maybe 13 years, 13 or uh, yeah, 12 to 14 year window. I started with just a notebook, notebook. And now we've talked about it a little bit on the podcast, but I started with a notebook and it was probably not very accurate. I would take these small notebooks out to eat with me and it was not coming from a place of dieting. I think that many individuals when they first start tracking are doing it for dieting purposes. I was doing it because I was so chronically small and was so in desire of adding muscle tissue and making sure that I was getting adequate calories. And so I was more so just tracking the overall calories and tracking the macronutrients, trying to make sure I got some level of protein in place. Um, So I started with the notebook and that helped me tremendously and helped me put on some weight for really the first time in my life. Like I was able to actually make strides working out. I was able to make strides in my uh, athletic performance and those different things. Uh, And then, and as I got into college, I was able to uh, start using my fitness pal and tracking during that period as well. I personally started and I had started with counting calories first and then I had gotten into IIFYM, 
which I know some people say it's like a nuanced conversation of IFYM versus like flexible dieting or tracking macros. But I think that it's worth notating the difference just because at that time, especially if I talk about like I track macros now, it looks so extremely different than when it did then because I was just trying to eat whatever I could to fit my macros. So meals would be, and not that any of these things are quote bad, I don't think food is good or bad, but it were was like eating ice cream and cereal and just whatever junk, so to speak, I could fit into what my macros were. It was with 0% desire of like eating higher quality or better food for me. And it was really cool because I was losing weight and I was dieting while eating all these foods that were denoted off limits for so long in my head when it came to losing weight or having the body that I wanted to have. And so it was a really beneficial and important part of my journey to have that, to recognize that there weren't really these bad and good foods. It was just being able to see that there's going to be more nutrient-dense, more calorically dense foods, less nutrient-dense, uh, less calorically dense foods, and they could fall on that spectrum um, and be okay. Whereas now, I'm really going towards a or in an approach where I'm eating high quality whole foods for a majority of my meals while still being able to enjoy the things I truly enjoy. Um, and it allowed me to also get very in tune with what I did enjoy because I would look at it kind of as a currency of this is what I have to spend, what is worth it to me to eat. Well, and I think that speaking on IFYM, it was part of the culture at mm -hmm. that time frame. It was a time where people were very set on meal plans and it was kind of like a middle finger to the meal plan uh, audience that we could eat whatever we wanted within the the cereal and the ice cream and all the junk basically um, that we could eat and still hit our macros and still have the body composition goals achieved that we were seeking. And so um, I think it was just part of that. And I also think that it speaks to when a, a new way of things is introduced, you have to go to this extreme for it to be introduced. And then the pendulum kind of swings back to find the middle ground. And so I always think of that in the context of someone introducing a new thing into their life that it may just require them to go to that extreme to find out like, that's not what I have to do. It's a way that I can do things, but I don't have to go about it that way. And this is more sustainable for me. And I think that it's great that you speak to of like, this is an, an important part of my journey because it allowed to, for me to get to where I am now. Because maybe if you didn't have that extreme approach of fit whatever I can into the macros, you may have not gotten here mm -hmm. um, and allowed for you to uh, find out more from a, a knowledge standpoint, because throughout that process of, of having more of the cereal and the ice cream, and again, not bad things, just in terms of quantity and those different factors, you were able to identify things that did not sit well with your stomach, things that you had be been dealing with for a long time mm -hmm. that you were like, oh my gosh, it's this. And I can remove this out of my diet. I can have better things in my diet. And now my digestion is functioning better. And so I think that having the exposure to the different foods and being able to take things out, put things in is also a really valuable tool. Yeah, it was allowing me, and I think, like you said, anything new that you're applying, you might swing in the opposite in one direction. But I think that's just the aspect of trial and error. Of you have to try something to see if it works for you, and then you kind of see what did work for me, what didn't work for me, what can I change to make it work better for me. And I think that's the whole path of not just thinking, oh, this is what someone says they're doing. I just need to apply that. It's what is working for me, what isn't working for me, and how can I amend this to make it work the best? I think two skills that are so important when it comes to nutritional approach or any new endeavor is that understanding that there's not only one way to do things and being willing to make changes for specific chapters of your life. Because how I track now is different than how I tracked five years ago. And then 
10 years ago type situation because of resources, because of knowledge, because of my digestion, because of the things that my body needs type situation. And so understanding that it's ever evolving and it's not just one way that you're just going to continuously do something. You're not going to hack the code and then that is how you do it for eternity. You've hacked the code maybe for this period of your life, but you're going to have to be okay with changes and not being married to this one track mind um, as you progress through life, because this is a tool that you're using forever. And it's not just for today and tomorrow. I love that you said that because that's so true with so many different aspects of your life. But with this specifically of also lifestyle can change or your goals can change. And so how you go about eating, how that fits into your routine, your day to day, that's going to vastly change. And you need to be okay with, I have to figure this out again. It, it's not that I figured it out once and never again. I have to figure this out again. And that's something like I foresee for ourselves of not only when we decide to start a family and the the process of like me being pregnant, that's going to vastly change how I go about food. Then us having a family is going to change how food looks in our day-to-day -day life. And we have to be willing to roll with that figure it out along the way, and just be okay with being in that space of things changing. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. What is the number one tip that you give to people when tracking macros? It's going to be the one that you probably are going to roll your eyes at a little bit, but pre-planning and pre-tracking your food. And I always like to bring up the question, when has there been a time that you have ever pre-tracked and pre-logged your food that you haven't hit your macros? Because I had to ask myself that question a few times when I felt like I just wasn't able to hit what I needed to hit. And a lot of it was due to lack of planning, lack of preparation, and lack of taking the time to really sit down and put it all together. And so I think that that is always my top tip, just because I know how even someone like myself who has been an experienced tracker for many years, I sometimes still have to pre-plan to make sure I hit everything. And yes, I'm definitely in a much better spot than I was, say, seven or eight years ago and being able to navigate through the knowledge that I have. But at the same time, there is so much power in just taking five or 10 minutes, pre-planning it all, and then being able to go on. And that can even be with pre-planning your grocery shopping or pre-planning some meals you know you're going to make that week. Uh, it doesn't always have to be, I'm going to pre-track everything for that day, and that's the only way that you can pre-plan. I think that pre-planning is the the biggest thing because it removes the the food focus. I think that so many people struggle when they start to track macros and they're trying to figure out exactly how they can hit it perfectly without the plan. And so then they're thinking about it all day. Mm -hmm. They have their first meal and they're like, okay, what am I going to have for lunch? And it's just like subconsciously in the back of their mind of when am I going to eat lunch? What am I going to eat for lunch? And then it's getting within maybe 30 minutes to an hour and now it's consuming their mind of what am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? And so all day you just have this subconscious question of what's next. And so then it is not playing a positive role of your relationship with food when you don't have things planned. And when you have things planned and something comes up, you can just remove the meal and it's already set up for you of like, these are the macros that you allotted for this. If you have to go out to eat, if you need to you know eat with your family, try to fit it in there. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work and you get back to it the next day. But having that pre-plan is, is so tremendously helpful as well as if you're playing macro Tetris all mm -hmm. day, it's exhausting. Very. Like even being a decade plus into this, I have no desire to yeah. play macro Tetris all day at the next, you know, play basically of the next meal, trying to figure out exactly how this is going to work. Because what I see oftentimes with clients is that they find themselves in the situation where one of the macronutrients that they're hoarding because they're afraid that they're going to go over ends up being 
extremely low at the end of the day. And oftentimes that's fats. So they're all of a sudden needing to have, I don't know, 30 or 40 fats with their dinner meal. And they're like, my dinner didn't digest well. I woke up feeling distension, uh, distension through my stomach or bloating. And it's like, well, you had this copious amount of fats with the meal that you had only an hour before you went to bed. Like, what did you think was going to be the outcome? And so by pre-planning, you just put yourself in a much better position to take care of yourself. It's not a neurotic thing to put these things in place of like, I'm, I'm food focused or this is, is not, what's the, what's the disordered. verbiage? Yeah. This is disordered eating. It's like, no, I'm just making this easier on my mind to fuel my body properly. I'm tracking macros. Maybe you're in a place where you're tracking macros to lose body fat. That could be part of your journey, or it could be that you're trying to add muscle tissue. But I would say a major, a greater majority of you all are tracking macros to fuel your body properly or should be. Like a, a greater portion of your time tracking is going to be in that realm. And so that's not disordered. That's doing good by your body. And thinking of it in that context is really important. Yeah, and the reason that I have to remind myself and still pre-track sometimes is because I know that with my schedule and how crazy things can get, that I can have the tendency to undereat. Right. And so macros allow me that accountability of you are hitting this, you know what you're hitting, because I find that there's two things that happen when people do not track throughout the day or I guess we could break it into three. But one is that people hoard their food and they undereat because they have no idea how much food they have eaten that day. And so they go on the quote safe side and they undereat in hopes that they can just have whatever left over at the end of the day. Or they eat and they end up overeating, then it's the end of the day and they are very hungry and they realize they've already gone over their macros and it could even be like 6 p.m. at night and you have realized you've already gone over your macros. And so in those two categories, that can both easily be fixed by having a plan in place. And even if, let's say that you put a plan in place and it still isn't perfect, like you haven't nailed down if this makes me feel my best, that that's just one day that you could be hungry or full or whatever it may be. And now you have data and information to go into the next day and make it better. And maybe some of the listeners have not had any experience tracking macros before. And that can be very daunting in the sense of as they approach macros, it's like this crazy world of I can eat absolutely everything what should I do? And I think that within the pre-planning, this is extremely valuable because now let's just go ahead and say you pick two to three meals that you love to have for breakfast. You don't have to have the um, quantities, but pick three meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that you really enjoy. And then by going through those meals and creating the quantities that fit the macronutrients that you need for the day, I think that that's the easiest way to kind of put that all together. And then you can kind of see of, oh man, like my, some of my favorite breakfast breakfast are all carbs and fats. Like I've got to figure out a way to incorporate more protein. And you may find that throughout your day. And that's going to be a really easy learning tool because the only way that you're going to get better at tracking macros is by tracking macros <laughs> and getting the reps in so that you can be to a place where you can look at a particular amount of food and say, ah, that's probably about four ounces of chicken. That's maybe a hundred grams of rice. And being able to make that decision because of the knowledge that you have accrued through repetition. It's not just going to be like, here's an ebook, read this, and you're going to have all the knowledge in the world. Like I, that is one of my biggest pet peeves. But. <laughs> I think that within macros, and we talk about it a lot in general, is that it is a tool for you to learn about food. And that's my biggest thing with macros through and through. It is also one of the most efficient ways that you can gain muscle and lose fat because you are able to track those variables. But I'm also aware that tracking macros might not be the best for every single person. But at the end of the day, it allows you to learn about what's in your food because there are so many times that I'll be having a conversation conversation and someone might be like, well, what even does have protein in it? Or what is, is this high in fat? Is this low in carbs? And to me, it feels even second nature of this time of you could say a food and I can tell you basically the macro breakdown of it. And that's from lots and lots of practice of tracking macros and going through that experience. And through that consistent experience of tracking macros, I have now created so much flexibility in my life because
because I can go into situations, whether I'm eating out, eating a meal with my family, or whatever it may be, and be able to make a conscious decision about what I'm eating or how that might need to adjust my meals later that day and feel great about it without any stress. And that type of flexibility and that intuitive nature where a lot of people search for how do I get intuitive with food? How can you even begin to believe that you could be intuitive about food if you've never learned about food? So you don't even know what is your baseline for what food is and how it is supposed to make your body feel. And being able to recognize that that consistency and that effort that you're putting in is going to breed so much flexibility down the road is something really encouraging for me. And I've seen it firsthand um, for myself. And then I've seen it for so many clients too, of just being able to truly take it as I am learning about food and learning about how food interacts with my body. And then they leave with really powerful understanding and relationship with food. With that knowledge, I'm sure you have some tips to share around grocery shopping and and meal prepping. What do you have to share uh, within that? I will have some videos linked in the show notes or in the description box uh, because I think that there will be some really great visuals. So we will have one going over what to do when your macros change and how to navigate changing what your food layout is when your macros do change. And also one talking about my fitness pal tips and tricks and things you need to know. And that specifically will also go into how to navigate when you're eating out and how to go about tracking your macros. Um, and specifically in a dieting phase. Um, But when it comes to the meal prepping and the grocery shopping, one thing I highly recommend, and this is not only for ease within tracking macros, but just like your own personal ease in general, because everyone has experienced buying something from the grocery store and it going bad in their house because they didn't use it at the right time or needing a bunch of ingredients for something and then making that meal once or twice and then you just have these odds and ends ingredients sitting around. And I hate that feeling so freaking much. I hate wasting food. And so my biggest recommendation is to have a core grocery list. And this means that you have a list that you can break off so many different meals from that core grocery list. Now, with this, we still change what groceries we have. So if it's either a seasonal thing or, hey, we really want burgers and maybe we don't have the stuff for burgers all of the time, I'll go ahead and add that to be able to have in place um, to make sure that we can have that. But it'll be things like, um, I'll even have it be, actually, if you go ahead and click the link below, you can get emailed to you a core grocery list. So I'll get that um, all set up instead of just running through a list with you today. And with that list, I will also show kind of some of those breakout meals that we make with similar ingredients so that I can minimize waste and just make it so much easier when it comes to tracking. Because if there are things that you regularly track and or eat, um, and specifically I'll talk about my fitness pal just because that's the one that Alex and I have the most experience with, uh, but those foods will show up. So it's going to be so much quicker to track than having to find all these new foods in my fitness pal. You'll just be able to see like your recent things that you've used, click on it and then be in a great spot. Absolutely. That'd be a great resource. Um, I will say that I grew up in a home that this is no hate to my mom whatsoever. Very ambitious with the foods that we should eat. And so we wasted a decent bit of food because of the things that she would see at the grocery store and be like, we should eat this. And then it would just sit in there and go to waste and it would go into the trash. And so that was something that you got me out of as soon as we started living together um, because you do have such a strong Mm -hmm. disliking for wasting food. It like grinds my gears so much. Not only does it just like wasted money, but it's also just like the most demoralizing feeling to pick something that's like still in like the container from the grocery and put it in the trash. It's like that feels awful. So any way that I can minimize that, I will. Um, And also speaking on those videos, if you've ever wanted to know like how to make it easier for tracking, like let's say uh, tracking a meal you eat 
all of the time or there's a recipe you really want to make but you don't know how to track it, the My Fitness Pal video that's linked below goes over those too. So those are a huge, huge help regardless if you've been tracking for a long time or you're newer to tracking because it can really make things so much easier and faster through the actual process of tracking, which I know that that is a huge thing too of, yes, when you're a beginner, there's going to have to be grace for yourself as you're learning a new skill. But especially as you carry on, any way that I can save time, I am going to utilize. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. It has been well documented on this podcast of my love for protein shakes and my commitment to <laughs> Your protein <commitment>. shakes. <laughs> so I would say that one massive tip is going to be single macronutrient snacks or things that you can grab and go with uh, to hit some of these macros when you've put yourself into a corner and only have this amount of protein or this amount of carbs or this amount of fats to finish the day. So what are some recommendations that you have around that? So always having one for each macro is what I recommend. So protein, I always go with protein shakes because they're greater protein powder in general, uh, or I'll say egg whites, because I also think about things that if I am truly at the end of the day, and let's say I only have protein left, what's something that is really only protein for the most part, and that I would eat by itself. So that's kind of the things that I keep in mind, because if it is of like, yeah, I could just have some ground meat, but am I just going to sit there and eat some ground meat with absolutely nothing else with it? Probably not. I actually prefer that sometimes. Okay. Like well. I would rather have <laughs> just six ounces of chicken. If, I, like, if I'm dieting, and it's between a protein shake and just six ounces of chicken, I'm probably taking the six ounces of chicken if it's prepared. Yeah, but I'm saying like it's – I'm in a pinch. I right, have right. like – Right, right, If you're in a pinch. I'm the end of the day and I only have one macro left. I always try to have like something I can go to. How hungry am I? That's not the question. <laughs> so egg whites or protein powder. Okay. And then when it comes to carbs, there's a lot of really easy go-tos oh, yeah. that are just carbs. So rice cakes are a great one that I always recommend because there are so many flavors and everything your heart could desire. And then fruit and or dried fruit are going to be incredible as really just mainly a carb source, um, if not only a carb source. And cereal is going to be another really solid one. And all things that I would eat eat by themselves. So I have to fit into that criteria. Now, fat gets a little bit tricky because I'm really not going to just have a spoonful of fat. But you don't I want to just have a spoonful of olive oil. I, I do not. But I do often recommend olive oils and stuff because what I normally do, whether my food is increasing or decreasing, is I normally have a core meals and structure and outline to my day. And then I have space that I can add or subtract from it. So it's not that I have to redo my whole entire meal. It's just that I can make these small changes to it, add on a few snacks, take away a few snacks, and that really helps me. And so with something like olive oil, I can take a meal, keep it the same, but if I have some more fats, then I can just put some olive oil on it versus if I don't, I can just take that away where it doesn't, it does change the meal, the taste a little bit, but it's not like this massive change to, okay, I had a whole egg um, for the this pancake I was going to make, but now I have to take out that egg because I don't have enough fat. And that's massively changing what the meal is going to be or the quality of the meal. So I do recommend olive oils in this case because there really isn't a great option for fat only with no other macro uh, to fall into. But normally people aren't left with just fat at the end of the day. Sometimes they are, but very seldom in my case. Also in those scenarios, it's fair game to move those calories over to other macronutrients if it comes down to it. Like, let's say that you do get to the end of the day and you have, oh, I was going to pick something that was a little bit easier from a math standpoint. Um, 
let's say that you have 30 grams of fat left and it's like, I'm not just going to have 30 grams of fat worth <laughs> of olive oil. That's going to be Are ridiculous. Are you not dedicated, bruh? Are you? <laughs> so you've got 270 calories that is, you can kind of disperse across the three macronutrients. Um, in a perfect world, you would hit your macros perfectly, but we're not in a perfect world and things happen and you've got to be able to adjust and adapt. And so, um, in that scenario, what would, what would you do with 270 calories? Do you have something off the top of your head? Well, depending if it's the fact that I've already hit my protein yeah, and proteins carbs, hit, carbs are hit. and I just have fat left over, then I would try to do something that is more fat focused, but being able to possibly bring in some of those other macros. So, um, with that, what originally comes to mind is a midday square because those are around 160 to 200 calories, I believe. And they are going to be like a 10 to 15 grams of fat while staying pretty minimal on carbs and protein. And in this case, like it is that you're going for calories over just the macros. But if I can help it of prioritizing that fat, then I want to. Because if I am, let's say 30 grams of fat under, for someone who has like 70 or 80 grams of fat, that might not be the end of the world. But if you only have like 40, 50 grams of fat and you're that much under, then I would like you to get some fat in. I wouldn't want you to just push it all over to carbs and protein and just leave yourself at having like 10 or 20 grams of fat in that day. Um, so I would want to be conscientious of that, but I would probably grab a midday square. I'd go midday square. Um, and I, I'm always, if I'm going to go on over on any macronutrient, it's probably protein. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Not saying that like you can't put on body fat from protein. It is the hardest of them, but I'm not saying like, just go gung ho an extra hundred grams of protein. <laughs> if you're hungry, just keep cranking on protein. Like you're just not going to, you know, add any body fat or have any GI distress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that was, uh, that was one thing that I wanted to touch on. Cause I think it's a very useful tool and a practical tool for the listeners, because even during our most recent dieting phase, I ran into that a number of times where, uh, I ended up just hitting the calories at the end of the day relative to the very weird disbursement of calories that I had, or I'm sorry, macronutrients that I had at the end of the day. You know what you could have helped that if you pre-planned pre -planned it. It's crazy. <laughs> Uh, I will say one other tip that I often recommend to clients so that they can have still consistency and they can meal plan, but they can still have flexibility is to be able to have a few meals that are the same macro breakdown or very close to each other. And we actually do this for our um, last few meals of the day. Uh, you specifically, you have a rotation of a handful of meals. Right now you have like um, a chili mango chicken, black bean and chicken and rice, a sweet and sour chicken, a beef meal, a few other ones, but you have a rotation of like five or six meals, but it it's not that you eat all of those meals every day. It's that your last two meals of the day, you're choosing within those six, but those are all relatively the same amount of macros. So you can swap those meals in and out without this huge like, oh, I want to switch this meal because I want it more. And then being like, now I got to rework all of my macros. You just kind of like, I want this meal today. Awesome. I got it. And then I just have these meals that I can choose from that are basically the same layout. Correct. I think it is a very valuable tool. And the last tip that I will leave the listeners with today is that it does not have to be the end of the world when things don't go exactly how you want them to. Tracking macros is a process and something that you're going to use as a tool for the rest of your life in some form of capacity. You're not going to always use MyFitnessPal, but you're going to use the knowledge that you're creating from using MyFitnessPal for the rest of your life, for the betterment of your health and the betterment of your well-being. And so understanding that you are just learning every day. Now, consecutively making the same error not a good thing, but making errors that you're learning from on a regular basis is part of the journey. And it actually should excite you because it's like, okay, I know better for now. And I have a, I have an answer. I have a fix to the problem that presented itself and I'm going to be better moving forward because of it. And so understanding that and, and not like one of the things with, with clients when they come to check-ins and they're like, I was, I was four grams over on my fat. Is that okay? It's like just one day. 
you know, that's all it was. And you're bugging about this. Yeah, we're, we're going to survive. It's all going to be okay. Um, and keep that in mind. That is a great thing to end on. If you guys have any other macro questions, then feel free to leave them below if you're watching this on YouTube. And we'll always have a form in the description box and show notes if you have questions that you want to submit um, via Google Forms. So we welcome them. We are happy to answer them. I am. I, I love talking about macros and nutrition and stuff like that. And I, I would say I'm somewhat of like a- You're pretty much a superstar. A superstar, that's what I'd say. So thank you guys so much for joining. Share this with a friend if you think that it would help them and we'll catch you in the next one.